and welcome to UFC's Inside the Octagon. John Gooden alongside Dan Hardy as usual. And today we're talking about the co-main event for UFC 215. This is the fight that was scheduled to go down at UFC 213 for the bantamweight belt between Amanda Nunes and Valentina Shevchenko. Nunes got injured and therefore it will have to be rerun in Canada. Talking of rerunning, we actually recorded an Inside the Octagon for UFC 213, which you guys didn't see. So we're going to dive into the vaults, let you watch it now, and afterwards, we're going to add some thoughts. The champion Amanda Nunes and Valentina Shevchenko. It is a rematch physically. OK, let's have a look at it. So there is a three-inch height advantage, a two-inch reach advantage. I know you're going to illustrate why that's so important as well, Dan. And Amanda Nunes topping these leaderboards with her aggressive fight finishing style. Yeah, well, let me just comment on the reach. Two inch reach is, is not a great deal, but Nunez uses her reach very well. She's very good at keeping people right on the end of her punches. Whereas Valentina Shevchenko, she often gives up reach. She's not a massive bantamweight no. in this division in comparison to some of the other people that she's fought. I mean, if you look at the Holly Holm fight, she gave up three inches in height and reach, but she really landed the majority of the quality strikes in that fight. So Against a top striker. Exactly, she knows how to find a way in. So it's not the be all and end all having a, right. having a reach advantage, but if anyone knows how to use it, it's Nunez. Okay, and she's got a, a fantastic kickboxing record and just a lifelong martial artist as well. Yeah, career martial artist. I mean, both of these ladies are, but you've got to think Shevchenko seems to have, you know, her whole life has been dictated by martial arts. She travels with her sister, she travels with her coach. They're constantly moving around the world, working with different people. It's everything that she does, apart from the, the dancing that we always see her celebrating yeah. with. She's, she's a, a, a really devastating striker. I mean, that, that kickboxing record says it all. Very impressive stuff indeed. Yeah. Okay, well, it's, it's always a bit difficult when we have these rematches, Dan, and uh, for us to come in here and, and start putting cases forward because you guys are always saying, well, what do they do different? I'm hoping that we're going to show a few more looks, but that sets us up to have a look at the highlights of their first meeting. Okay, let me quickly talk you through this one. It was a fascinating first fight, and it was, there were, it was very much a fight of two halves. Unfortunately, over three rounds, you can't half it. You know, someone's going to win two rounds, and that's what happened here. So in the first, in the get-go, th there was a feeling out process, it's kind of testing each other's range, seeing what strikes they were favoring. But when Nunez started to put a stamp on it, it was the aggression that started to tip the scales. She was the one that was pushing forward, and eventually she gets this beautiful trip takedown, which I think more than anything caught Shevchenko by surprise. And then she was able to land a few good shots, but the first round, Shevchenko did a good job of defending, of upsetting her balance. You, you see she gets a nice cheeky ankle sweep there, but then she immediately taken down. That's the end of the first round. We come into the second round, and you can see Shevchenko's now starting to try and stamp her, her, her dominance on this fight a bit more, but Nunez is not having any of it. She's still pushing forward, she's still being the aggressor, and even in this takedown exchange, she's the one that scrambles and gets to the top position, which is where she spent the majority of the rest of this round. But this time, she landed a lot of heavier, more hurtful shots, which you can see on Shevchenko's face was, was unexpected and really kind of took some of the fight out of her. It was a great second round for Nunez, and she was able to take the back, able to sink her hooks in and threaten with the rear naked choke. But as you would expect with such high-level grapplers, Shevchenko was able to stay out of danger and was able to survive that round. Third round now, this is when it starts to get different. We see Amanda Nunez still being aggressive, but now things start to fall short. We see her going for takedowns and getting reversed. We see her reaching for things and getting punished. Now, this, is, this for me is Nunez slowing down. This is Shevchenko showing her conditionings there and slowly picking her pace up as the fight goes on. Now, what's interesting here is that that was the end of the third round. If you add two more rounds onto that, that very much changes the landscape of this fight because Shevchenko was the one that was continually getting better, whereas Nunez had two good rounds and then immediately faded in the third. So if you add another 10 minutes on, you've got to think that it would have edged towards Shevchenko. Well, that's a narrative that I've been reading as well. But these two women have invaded one another's personal spaces on a couple of occasions. The one that springs to mind is Juliana Pena. After Shevchenko got that victory, then it was on. It was like, right, I'm yeah. going to take that belt from you. And then, of course, we had the presser as well. Well, this got a little heated. I don't know how you feel about this, Dan, but this was kind of a little bit naughty <laughs> from the champion. It, it was a little bit, and you could see you could see Sean Shelby's face immediately. It took him by surprise because she walks up, Ooh, she's so friendly, friendly, she calls her on, and then Shevchenko walks up. She looks very confident, very calm, but Nunez immediately steps into her space. She puts her fist on her face and she pushes her away with it. Wasn't a punch. 
There was a bit of disagreement as to who was the first one to make contact with the fists. Yeah. But it was definitely Nunez that stepped forward into that space. She was the one that was being the more threatening person, which tells me that she, she respects Shevchenko. She knows the danger that she poses. I mean, Shevchenko is the only person that, that Amanda Nunez has beaten by decision. She's been to, to decision twice. It's the only time she's been to decision in the UFC, and it was a very close fight. So yeah. she knows that she's probably the greatest risk to her belt that she's faced so far. So Shevchenko thinks that she's got Nunez on tilt after that. Um, but let's park that for a second. What do you think Shevchenko can draw from their first fight and bring in, in a positive way, to this next meeting? Well, I, th I think it's exactly what I was talking about. She, she, she didn't lose the, two, the first two rounds in a big way. I mean, she lost the second round fairly comfortably, but the first round was still fairly back and forth. But, you know, going on from that, we see her fight Holly Holm, who's a, an excellent striker and a big physical specimen in this division. And Shevchenko was able to stay calm, pick a shot. She's got a really good counter left hook that you see there, catching Holly Holm right on the chin. And you've got to think if Nunez is the one that's been the more aggressive fighter, if she's crashing forward, she's going to be looking to, to land that counter right hook. And then she can start to put uh, longer combinations together when she starts to see Nunez slow down. But it's about fighting out of that defensive, first off, first and foremost. Those first two rounds, she knows that Nunez is going to try and stamp a, a mark on this fight. So if she can start to clinch her, tie her up, hit her with some knees, she's very strong in the clinch, yeah. even though she's undersized. Obviously, you know, to do with that judo black belt that she has. And against Sarah Kaufman, who is worth noting was 17 and 3 when she stepped in against Shevchenko. She's a the Kinda. consummate veteran. Yeah. She really knows how to make things work. And Shevchenko was able to bully her over in situations. And here again, watch this beautiful balance. She goes for a trip, Kaufman digs her heels in, but Shevchenko is still able to land on top. And in the scramble, immediately lands a knee to the midsection. There's that constant thought process of offensive as well, even when she's being defensive. But anything that she can do that upsets Nunez's balance, that puts her on the floor, that, that catches her as she's moving in, is going to slow her down. It's going to make her second guess herself. She's not going to be as overly aggressive if she's missing her punches and getting caught with counter right hooks. She's also not going to want to be initiating into the clinch if every time she does, Shevchenko is starting to sweep her feet because then she's using energy systems, she's engaging muscles that she doesn't really want to be doing, especially thinking about a five round fight. She needs to be conserving as much energy as possible. So if Shevchenko can push her, but not take too many risks in the early couple of rounds. I think she, I think it bodes well for the later rounds, certainly the championship rounds. And I really like that combination of uh, Shevchenko's black belt in judo and then her Muay Thai experience. Yeah. She's just deadly in the clinch. Mm -hmm. Well, let's have a look at Nunes then. She has not been paid for overtime. That has shown in the way that she's finished her most recent fights with striking. Is there anything that we can take from those performances that might add some value to this in their rematch? Well, we know she's a finisher. We know she can stop people with strikes and she's got a very aggressive style. But like I said, there's a very technical edge to it as well. If we go back to the Sarah McMahon fight, you can see how she punishes people though. She doesn't let them off the hook. And this is something that she's going to have to do in this fight because the, the, the spaces in which to capitalize on Shevchenko's vulnerabilities are very, very small in comparison to a lot of people. Now you see this one, Sarah McMahon has thrown a low kick and Nunez has stepped back away from it. And just this moment of vulnerability here allows her to step in. You can see Sarah McMahon's turning. She had no idea she's turning onto a powerful right hand. And as Nunez lands the punch, look at this. I mean, the fullest extension. She uses every inch of her reach she's got. I'm just going to draw you a line on this, John. Why are so you, you doing can... that? More important than that, Shevchenko. Have you seen her dance? Have you seen her do a 360? <laughs> that's very true. She can do it that much in, quicker. in much tighter space as well. <laughs> that's so that's true. not going to happen. That's very true. She'll be, she'll be able to pivot a lot quicker than Sarah McMahon. <laughs> that's true. Just look at this. So the foot's planted on the back. So from the, from the, the, from the fullest extent of her reach, She's planted, she's rooted all the way down. So she's driving that power into her opponent. But it's the distance that she covers when she's doing it. So those moments of vulnerability that Shevchenko will show her, that she'll be aware of from the first fight, she'll be able to exploit in this one. She'll be looking to exploit those techniques. But the, the power and the ferocity of her striking is something that really sets her aside from everybody else in this division, in my opinion. And we saw that against, uh, against Misha Tate, you know, when she won the title. Picking her off at range, it's almost like Misha Tate's arms were half the length of Nunez. It's like a ghost. It, it's ridiculous how she's able to keep people on the end of her reach and keeps her hips back. Do you know what I mean? She's fast feet, similar to, similar to Robert Whittaker in that respect. Moves her feet back. 
keeps people on the end of her range. And when she does close distance as well, she knows how to find ways to land hurtful shots. Like whether it's a knee, whether it's a smash elbow, no matter what it is, she's, she's, there, to, she's there to be violent and she's there to be damaging. And that's what we see in every one of her fights. Same thing with, with Ronda Rousey. You would expect Ronda to come in and immediately clinch her. And Nunez denied that at every opportunity. She never allowed Ronda to really get a good establishment of her grip. Every time, pushing her away, picking the shots, like always on the length of her punches. Look at this. Like she's, when, when she's landing those punches, they are, they are right on the end of her knuckles. That's the most powerful. She's just throwing all that momentum into the punch. If they smothered that punch, it would be half the power. Do you know what I mean? Like there are some people that can generate power at short range, Shane Carwin kind of guys. But when it comes to Amanda Nunez, her most powerful shots are right on the end. And that's where she does her best work. And I guess she's, she's also out of danger as yeah. well once she's done it because she's, she's generated a little bit that someone's bounced off of those and she's, she's not in danger of getting countered. Which then allows her to continue pushing forward if they do start to back up, which just plays into her game. And ju just another point, do you think she's garnered a little bit more confidence in that anti-judo as well? Because Ronda Rousey and then Shevchenko again, she said to herself, look, I'm, I'm good with yeah. this. Well, if you look at the two people that she's fought since, uh, since Shevchenko, I mean, uh, Obviously, Ronda Rousey is an excellent judoka, but Misha Tate's an excellent wrestler as well. We can't forget that. So she, she's seen two different looks of grappling prowess. She's seen the, the wrestling ability. She, she's seen the judo. She's dealt with both. She's stopped them both with strikes in a very, very violent and, and, and you know... Concussive match. Yeah, man. very, very yeah. much so. So she knows that she doesn't need a great deal of time in order to exploit these opportunities. Yeah. Shevchenko is a different, a different cat entirely. She's, she's, very, um, she's very much a, a, a defensive striker. She finds her opportunities. So that aggression needs to be reined back a little bit, but the power can't be, can't be pulled out of those punches. Okay. She still needs to throw with venom. Okay, all right. Twitter, thank you to everyone that sent some questions in. And let's go here with uh, Michael Gouldy. How well prepared do you think Shevchenko will be for the championship rounds? Well, I know that she's training in Colorado at Elevation and... Is the question about Shevchenko in, in her conditioning, do you think? I don't think it is. I don't think, there's, I don't think there really is a question about Shevchenko's conditioning. She's, she does this all the time. She, you know, as soon as she's finished a fight, she's straight back into train for the next one. This, that constant uh, work rate maintains that base level of conditioning at a very high level. Now, Amanda Nunez, one thing that stood out in that face-off is how, how much bigger she looks, physically stronger. She's not only doing conditioning, but she's doing a lot of strength training as well, which adds to her power, but may be detrimental later on in the fight. So, you know, that's something we have to think about. Like now, with Shevchenko, when it comes to the clinch work, she doesn't seem to need a lot of physical size in order to be dominant. She uses a lot of these nice, sneaky little trips, upsetting people's balance. And this, again, playing into her judo. Good at manipulating people's balance from her body lock, from her head and arm clinch. And, and anything that she can do which, which upsets the balance of Nunez will cause her to, to use that energy expenditure, will cause her to engage muscles that she doesn't want to use. I mean, look at her wrestling Holly Holm to the floor here, who's a one of the biggest, strongest bantamweights I've mm. ever seen. And against Juliana Pena in her last fight as well, it's the timing. She's not expending a lot of energy in these situations. It's very economical. So she can maintain this over five rounds. Whereas a, an easy sweep for Shevchenko is a difficult get up off the floor for Nunez, which plays into that. And even if she does end up on the bottom, we know she's got submissions. I mean, this is a, a stunning arm bar over, over Juliana Pena. Yeah. And she knew that with that arm bar, she was immediately up there for a title shot. So that, I mean, that's not, only, that's not just anybody she's fighting. This was a number one contender's fight and she finished it in style with a beautiful armbar, which is also interesting because she spent a good portion of the first and second round against Nunez on her back. And you could see she was constantly trying to tie up the arms. And also in the clinch, she was out wrestled in, in certain circumstances. So if you're Shevchenko, you're going back to your training camp thinking, I have to make a few corrections in order to face her again. What do you look for? You look for submissions off your back, which we've seen proven, and you look for takedowns in the clinch against big, strong athletes like we saw in the Holly Holm fight. Yeah. So it almost seems to me like she's covered those bases, she's tested them in her last two fights, and now she's stepping in with supreme confidence to get that belt. Grappling versus grappling. Again, I, I really like this one. We've seen it before, but we have a brown belt. Yeah, brown belt in judo, judo, black belt for Nunes. Yes. Yep. And it's, is it the reverse? 
Maybe. Yes, a black belt in judo for, for Shevchenko. For Shevchenko. Mm. So that, that pitch is quite an interesting grappling exchange. Um, but let's take a closer look at the Lioness then. Yes, much more, of a, much more of a physically dominant style, much less finesse in the trips and the throws, much more about just being physical. Uh, great balance here, comes from a judo background, obviously, but a lot of it as well down to her being a, a great athlete. Good balance against uh, against Kat Zingano, who's a great wrestler. Same again with with Sarah McMahon, which was this was an astonishing takedown that she defended. A full body lock against an Olympic wrestler, and she's able to stay on her feet. Was able to find space, and then same thing as always. When she breaks, she's immediately on the offensive. Beautiful double leg from Misha Tate scrambles back to her feet and turns it on on Misha Tate immediately again looking for that reshot she's there she, she's 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 aware of what the dangers are she's, yeah. she'll defend the first takedown she's ready for the second one and a nice reversal there as Misha Tate starts to slow down immediately punishes her for it so it's not only is she stuffing the takedowns but she's reminding you not to do it again and then when it comes to the ground and pound she's very aggressive here as well which which keeps her opponents flustered you can see Kat Zingano who's, who's a, a a very high level fighter and a good wrestler but she was just she was stifled with that in the first round and then she steps in against Sheila Gaff, who's another veteran of the game. She's able to muscle her to the floor and that aggressive overbearing ground and pound where she's got her shoulders over her opponent and she's able to drive all of her weight into those elbows. And even if she doesn't get the finish with ground and pound, we saw in the Sarah McMahon fight, she'll lock up a rear naked choke and even across the chin, she's squeezing, making it very uncomfortable for Sarah McMahon to the point where she actually lifts her chin up to avoid the pressure on her chin and gives her the rear naked choke. She has a lot of tools in the bag, but everything's backed up with aggression. So no matter what she does, this ferocity that comes with it, is that lioness mentality that comes yeah. with it. Whereas Shevchenko, the bullet, she's the assassin, she's the Bond villain, she's the one that will wait and she'll look for that opportunity and not expose herself and then go for the kill shot. They're very, very different fighters. And because they've fought once before, to see them in a rematch, both having tweaked their games, who knows what's going to happen? And the gold's on the line. It gets really exciting. And Shevchenko said she wants to be like a Kalashnikov. Right. <laughs> Efficient and adaptable. <laughs> yeah. Which, are, which I thought was quite nice. And I think it's worth also saying that Nunes has such a high proportion of her strikes on the ground as well. Yes. So she marries that up really nicely. A lot of those game. a lot of those would have come from that second round of Shevchenko. That probably right. pushed her stats right up. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. Back to Twitter. Where should we go here? Uh, let's go down to this one. Is the gas tank still an issue for Nunes? We haven't seen it amended as she finished Ronda and Misha early. Yeah, good point. But the counter to that surely has to be you're preparing at ATT. Yeah. They're super professional. They've got a lot of coaches and science at their disposal. Yes. Yeah, she did beat Nunez and Ronda early, but they were both five-round fights that she was preparing Can't for. Can't blame her for that either, No, right? not at all. No, I mean, why work Why work more than you need to? She's, you know, she, she can get the fight finished, so she did. The, the thing that you've got to bear in mind when you, when you train at a place like American Top Team, it's, it's not a small gym where you've got a few friends around you and you're working towards, uh, you know, towards a fight. She's got coaches here that are not necessarily invested in her as an individual, but in the success of the team. So you've got Mike Brown here, you've got Conan Silvieri, you've got loads of great people around her, and every one of those will be brutally honest with her. Right. If they thought there was a question with her conditioning, they'll bring that to her. They'll say, hey conditioning is today and you were talking about how you know they have the, the 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 schedule sent to their phone they know exactly what they're doing on each day so it's being dictated for her what she does so they will build a training camp to maintain a champion yeah. and that's exactly what they've done and Shevchenko mentioned with training at altitude she's at uh, 303 yes. which is of course home to Rose Namajunas. Rose, yes, who's an, another person that we never see struggle with her conditioning, has a ferociously high work rate, which is a, a great training partner for Shevchenko. They're not massively different in size. Obviously, Shevchenko is going to be slightly bigger being the weight class above, but that means that, that, that um, Namajunas is, is a fast fighter. She moves fast. She creates scrambles, which is going to test Shevchenko in different ways. But, you know, training at altitude is going to pay dividends in the later rounds. Obviously, the altitude is, is a real benefit to anybody for their conditioning. And then just the way that she trains. Nama Yunus, like I said, she's always got a high work rate. She always pushes at pace. And Shevchenko is that kind of fighter as well. So I think that's a perfect place for her, a perfect training partner and a perfect team at elevation. She seems to have all the pieces in line ready for this rematch, and, and as does Nunez. You know, that's yeah. why it's a real coin toss for this yeah. one. Yeah, I mean, they're high level. They're now rounding out their games, and I guess conditioning is such a big focus when you're going into a title fight. Uh, approximately what kind of percentage do you think they would be emphasising the conditioning to be able to keep their game, you know, at a high rate? 
I, I, I mean, you've got to think that at least 30 or 40% of, their, of their, their training week is dedicated to, to conditioning, whether it's specific conditioning training sessions, working on their, their recovery, their cardiovascular output, VO2 max, all these different things that you can focus on, or whether they're putting her in, in mixed martial arts situations when she's tired and forcing her to work out of them. So she's working the sport-specific energy systems that she'll need in the fight. But again, both, both ladies have got great teams around them and they'll both be constructing their training camps slightly differently. So, you know, if this goes Shevchenko's way, a rematch is surely on the horizon. Then we get to see them adapt one more time. And it's these kind of matchups that make both fighters continue to improve right. and get better, which is great for the sport. Yeah. One other thing then. Nunez, as we saw at the Facts and the Stats page, is smashing it across the leaderboard. Yeah. And when she beat Ronda Rousey, she went backstage just shouting, no more Ronda Rousey, time for her to retire. I'm, I'm the one that everyone should be talking about now. She has an opportunity again to go a little bit further. Do you think that she places the emphasis on, on those kind of awards uh, to really help motivate her? I guess it's a legacy argument. Is yes. she doing this for her legacy? Yeah, with, without a doubt. You know, you've got to think of, like, she, the, the win over Misha Tate was massive to, to get the belt, especially at UFC 200. They got promoted to the main event, the main event on the card. It was a, a really big deal for her to be in that situation. She was impressive. It was probably the best performance of her life. She got the belt. And then the best thing to do then is to go on and fight Ronda Rousey, who is the superstar of female mixed martial arts, and for her to beat her in such devastating fashion. I mean... We saw the Holly Holm knockout go viral. People around the world saw that. But the, then to see Ronda come back, there's much more of a story there. So many more people will have tuned into that fight. So then for, it to, then for them to see Nunez step into the scene and just be so much more dominant than anybody else that Ronda's ever fought was a massive statement to her. It really raised her brand and really raised her game. And now she's a superstar. She lives in Florida. She's enjoying the, the accolades of being a champion, walking yeah. through the streets, being celebrated by her fans. She doesn't want to lose that. She's going to cling on to that belt with everything that she's got. OK, Dan, well, time has passed. So that's only the only stuff we can really look at. But I want to ask you a question. Do you think the fallout from 213 hurt Amanda Nunes? She was getting a, a bit of flack online. Yeah, possibly a little bit. I, I don't think that she's going to... Um, I don't think she can be too concerned with it. Obviously, it was out of her control. She didn't feel like she could compete to her fullest potential. And... You know, sometimes you have to err on the side of caution. It was High a, stakes. Exactly. It was, it was a, a balance uh, problem. Yes, like was a it? vertigo issue, exactly, like yeah. sinus problems. Yeah. I mean, you know, at this high level, especially when you're fighting someone like Valentina Shevchenko, you need to be at your best. And if you don't feel like you can defend your belt with, with everything that you have, then, then it's the right thing to do. The only thing that comes out of it is that I would imagine both women are quite impatient to get this one started, particularly Shevchenko, who was, who was fired up and ready to go. So... Um, no, I, I, don't, I don't think it's hurt either one of them. I think maybe Shevchenko may have a little bit more confidence now knowing that Nunez is potentially not at 100%. But, you know, that's the nature of this sport. Sometimes you're not 100% when you get in there. But I think we'll certainly see a better account of her on this, on this date. OK, so an extension of fight camps. Maybe they lost some momentum. They'd have to pick it back up. We shall see at UFC 215. OK, well, that wraps us up for this episode. Thanks for checking it out. We hope you enjoy the fights. Keep the conversation going in the comment section below and online using the hashtag InsideTheOctagon. From Dan and I, rest of the team, thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.